Oh my God. You know what's bringing me joy in 2022? This is a black renaissance on so many levels. There is this beautiful space right now that black people are occupying in every area of fashion. I'm super excited for black models. We've got Lamika Fox, and we've got Jordana, and we've got Giselle, and we've got Ducky Thought, and we've got a Dutt, and we've got a Nuck, and we've got a Wo, and we've got Iman Hamam. All these girls working, each more different and more exotic and more beautiful and special than the next. But also, we have the model as activist. It's the model who uses her platform to enact change, who are speaking to power when fashion makes mistakes. This is the next generation where black models are taking center stage. The time has come that we are now able to see all the diversity in what we call black models. Everybody is so unique in their own way, in different skin tones, in, uh, in different sizes. I got goosebumps when I saw Precious Lee walking in Versace. I was like, there she goes. That's a black girl, regardless what size she is, what color she is, that's what she brings to the table. I'm obsessed with Precious Lee and, and what she's been able to become. And she knows her attributes. She knows what's beautiful about her body. She loves being a woman. She exemplifies that. And to see that, you know, a Versace or these other houses are celebrating her for that, it's amazing. It's beautiful. Precious is incredible. She's destined for really big things, even outside of fashion. You can see, you can see her in Hollywood. I think she generation. should go into politics. Yeah. <laughs> The beauty of Precious is that she's a new voice for the generation and to girls that say, I can be a part of this fashion world. I've always been a creative person and I love the moment you're creating, we're creating. I love shooting and contorting my body and moving and blowing hair. I love doing things that we haven't seen. Because at the end of the day, it could just be a photo shoot or it can be a timeless picture that's gonna live forever. I grew up in a very expressive house and fashion was a part of everything that I did. Didn't necessarily like go out for modeling. I always wanted to be an advocate, you know, to be able to really support people in a way to help them bring out their creative side. And I wanted to do that as a lawyer. Modeling, actually began for me at the Clark Atlanta University Homecoming Fashion Show. And after the show, Victoria Duru, my very first agent, she offered me a contract. New York is the Olympics of fashion. The agency that wanted to sign me was at the time the top agency for Curve. And I decided to give it one year, and I said if it's not epic, then I'm going to law school. It's epic now. I never intended on doing things that were not going to be expansive in the industry. To be on the British Vogue cover by Stephen Mizell, to be on the September American Vogue cover, the most iconic and impactful issue in fashion. <laughs> it set the tone for a lot of things and a lot of change and opened up what it means to be a part of fashion. Specifically at the time of the September issue, September 2021, it was so important and impactful for me, especially after what we've been through. And the impact that it could have on someone that was my age, that... <sighs> it just meant so much not having such a marginalized view of who and what could be considered a supermodel. 2020, a pandemic and seeing the George Floyd murder, 
ignited a lot of things in creatives, and creatives were not taking it anymore. And I think that a lot of the industry has become aware of the importance of having to show up. For me, it has always been that the changes do not happen if the system stays the same. Things are more clearer, and there are swift decisions are being made by corporations. Bethann used to say to me, to be an activist, you have to be active every day. America's on fire. They gonna burn those cities down. Black Joy, Black Peace, Black Justice was a song that I wrote during the Black Lives Matter protests. I just want to take a few moments to discuss how I feel about what's going on and how my industry is reacting to it. I see all the agencies, magazines, brands posting black screens on their Instagram accounts. But what does that really mean? What is the fashion industry actually going to do about it? Is this just another trend? Models are no longer silent. They used to be these beautiful images, beautiful faces, and they didn't have the voice. Today, they have a voice. This industry that profits from our black and brown bodies, you're part of the cycle that perpetuates these conscious behaviors. It's hard to have a voice in an industry where they tell you, you know, shut up and look pretty. You know, you're just meant to look. I mean, it's specifically important for black models to use their platform, to use their voice, stand up for what they believe in, stand up for who they are. But as a mother of black sons, I have to become active. I have to take steps. I myself have experienced police brutality in Australia. I myself have been hit. I myself have been joked. We have to tell the people what is going on. Having the conversation you know, with other models it's uncomfortable, you know, you're challenging other clients by speaking out. Models have turned the spotlight onto fashion itself. To my beloved fashion industry, if you truly care, then show it. In the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, the global fashion industry is facing a racial reckoning. The changes do not happen if the system stays the same. So the industry itself is trying to cleanse itself. We have a lot of discussions now, more openly. I know that what they see first is my blackness. The younger generation today, they're just more conscious of what our history is. This is the next generation who are putting fashion to task. Changing the narrative. Companies think, oh my God, you know, we have to do more than just have black models on their feeds, but they really had to create advertising campaigns. They had to really use black models more than once. What's more important is who's on your board of directors, who's doing makeup and hair. You know, is there diversity there? Being inclusive in your business, being inclusive in your campaigns, your ads. And so that's what I want to see change. Models are making sure that fashion is fair and that it's democratic. The new generation, they want a revolution. In the wake of the nationwide fight against racism and social injustices, two fashion insiders took matters into their own hands and launched an initiative called the Black in Fashion Council. The Black in Fashion Council was started by Sandrine Charles and the amazing Lindsay Peoples, who was editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue, the youngest of all time. My goal is that diversity and equality and inclusivity, all those things don't just sit in an HR room. There's a coalition of black professionals in the fashion and beauty industry who are there to give advice. They can get luxury brands and businesses so they can put black creatives in front of them. That's a wonderful thing. Mama B is part of Black and Fashion Council and she always calls me her firecracker, <laughs> which is correct. Lindsay's essence and vision is so clear, it is revolutionary. It shouldn't be, but it is.
Black and Fashion Council advocates for more black designers, and the work is paying off. There are more black designers that people can name now than ever. People like Sergio Hudson. Telfar Clemens. Laquan Smith. Christopher John Rogers. Kirby at Pierre Moss. Olivier Roustang from Balna. This moment, we have all the cover of magazines, campaigns, and at one point, you were just like, wow, from one year to another, the fashion industry completely changed. Oliver is actually the first designer that ever believed in me when I came to Paris. So shout out to Oliver <laughs> for believing in a little Nigerian girl. I just don't want that kids wake up tomorrow and think fashion is not for me because I'm not represented. That's why I decided to be a fashion designer. It just makes you feel more powerful working off this black designer and just bringing it all together. And they're all being very intentional about featuring black models in their collections and black models of different body types, different age groups. Makai Carter, he was shooting for Pierre Moss, and it was so special to be on set with a black photographer. I started working with black photographers, and that was recently. Um, that I was able to kind of be in a place where I could request young black photographers. Up until then, if I wasn't allowed to ask for that, it wouldn't happen. So that tells you right there that there's quite a bit that needs to happen. I still think it's weird that there's like first time black photographer has ever shot for so-and-so or so-and-so. Like, you know, that has been recent. I've worked with Tyler, who he was the first, right? Again, I don't know how great that is that it's this late and he's the first. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's like three years ago. My name is Dana Scruggs. I'm a photographer and director. I was the first black woman to shoot for ESPN's The Body Issue. And I said I shouldn't be the only one shooting these covers. And I said the same thing when I became the first black person to shoot the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. Like, y'all need to get it together. It's really important to always bring other Black people with me. There's been a real community that's been built because so many Black photographers have been helping each other. Me and Law talk about it all the time. It's definitely not a lack of talent. It's just a lack of opportunity. When there's more of us, there's more opportunities for all of us. Capturing images of Black women is very important because we need to see ourselves. If you only see images of women that do not look like you, then you start to think, wait, wait is there something wrong with me? Am yeah. I not beautiful? Am I not considered beautiful? Does the world not think of me as yeah. being beautiful? To have Black women represented is really repopulating that landscape of what beauty looks like. When I started photographing women, I wanted to see women like my mother, I wanted to see women like my grandmother. I wanted to see like my aunties and my cousins because I felt like they were everyday women, specifically everyday black women, that you were not seeing in popular culture. And so I figured that the only way to do that is to make the images myself. One of the things that I make sure that I do is that I capture the power of their gaze. They're looking directly into the lens so that way the viewer feels that gaze. They are saying, I'm here to be seen. It's important for other non-Black people to see Black people because they see them in everyday life. We are home, kids. Let's see who's home. How is that you miss us in media? How is that you miss us in politics? How do you miss something you see every day? I locked myself out. This is part of the glamour. My name is Wang Chuo. I was born in Kaakuma, Kenya, which is a refugee camp in Kenya. At the age of seven, we flew to Australia, and I grew up in Sydney for the past 16 years of my life. To our wedding, darling, thank you for being raw and uncut. Wow. I definitely have experienced my fair share of being othered, of being the next thing, tokenism, of being, you know, like the loud black girl, the angry black girl, especially in high school. My high school experience wanted me to fit in this little box. So I started a lot of fights, <laughs> I started a lot of arguments, hard pill conversations to swallow. Um, I brought in the conversation of LGBT into my school. Uh, my school is predominantly Muslim. And when I brought that up, that was a whole drama. Trying to just have my seat at the table was always a fight. I mean, I'm the woman I am today because of all those experiences. So I'll move on. And I'm doing great right now, so it's okay. <laughs>
I actually got scouted at McDonald's initially. I was working there, I had like three jobs. And um, somebody walked in, I don't remember her name for the life of me, and was like, oh, you're beautiful, you should be a model, your scars, like she was just staring, and I'm like, honestly, just give me your card. They gave me their card, and then I went to Melbourne, I flew to Melbourne for a meeting, and I signed a contract, and then two weeks later, I believe, I was in Paris, walking Vetement exclusive, so that was exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is real life, you know, this is what I want to do. And then my next big job was Savage Fenty with Rihanna. Uh, the show starts iconic. The dancers are going, the thing, everything is going, finale's happening, and Rihanna does her walk around the models and stops at me to tap me on the shoulder and say I'm beautiful. She's always affirmed my beauty, and I really, really love that because obviously, as a black woman, sometimes you don't think you fit into the like European standards of beauty, and to have such a phenomenal woman tell you that you're beautiful constantly every time she sees me, it's like, girl, as you should, you know? The way I choose every person that's gonna be in this show is I want people to feel represented. When you think of a brand like Fenty, and what Rihanna's done with that brand. She's had such success because she's casting real women in her pieces, and people have really responded to that. Fenty opens us up to the untraditional model on the runway. There are models with disabilities. There are women with vitiligo. There are models who wear hijab. There are women with albinism. There are models who are plus size. Black models open the door for them. It's not just one type of beauty. It's several types of beauty. Other conversation that is so important that all of us are having across all of Vogue's and I think within the industry today is body diversity and how we need to be inclusive not only in skin color but in body shape. I've always just been bigger my whole life, bigger than everybody else, so I definitely had to learn that I could be a model. <laughs> Thank you. I'm looking at one of my proudest moments. It was the first ever curvy high fashion editorial styled by Nicola Formicelli. This was surreal. <laughs> you know, it's funny, I've seen this so many times and I never react like this, but I think just because of why we're here right now. And just knowing that this set it off. It's incredibly important to have, you know, black women represented because it reflects the world that we're living in. We need to use our storytelling and our image making and the videos that we create at this magazine to have that responsibility and make sure that we are representing the world from a global perspective. Since the beginning of Vogue, covers have represented milestones of progress, and we're still seeing that progress today. Just look at Paloma El Cesar's 2021 solo cover of Vogue. That was groundbreaking. I'm really nervous. My heart's beating out of my chest, but um, let's look at this iconic wrapping. Okay. Oh. Are you ready? Oh, ready? Okay. I'm like shaking. Okay. Oh, really? <laughs> Turn it around. <laughs> Let me see. Turn it around. <gasps> oh, girl! For a mixed black person to be on the solo cover of American Vogue, that was like a very big deal, especially not occupying a thin body type. Thank you. Oh my God! Oh, it's so beautiful. It's beautiful. It's so, so proud of you, baby. And that's super powerful to me. My that girl, that's my baby girl, on the cover of Vogue. Oh my oh God! Oh my God! Oh Love. my God! Today, the very definition of a model has shifted. Black models have exploded off the cover and into the world. Models have infiltrated places you never thought just the model should go. We have models who are chefs. I always had this sort of secret urge to become a chef. Models who are influencers and build their own following. I do beauty videos, fashion content, and sometimes I try to dance. Models who are athletes. Recently, I just designed a Wilson basketball in partnership with the WNBA. 
uh, designed a shoe with Adidas. Models who are game developers. Models who use their creativity to design and write. After many years of modeling, I decided to go after one of my other passions, which is design. And I'm like, I love writing books. I'm a published author. Models aren't just faces anymore, you yeah. know? And maybe they can go on to be an actor, an actress. But the world is now open to them, I think, in a way that wasn't possible before. 10 years ago, I started acting. Most recently, I have been on a show called Titans on HBO Max. I am a multi-hyphenate. I'm a master storyteller. I am a poet. I am a writer. I will soon be an author with a published piece of work. Nobody's one thing. We have to allow women to be whatever they want to be in the world. This is such an exciting time because we are having a much broader and deeper and more inclusive dialogue around what is beauty. You know, when we talk about inclusivity, it's not just about race or color, it's about sexuality, it's about size, it's about gender. You're my man. Everybody knows it. But you also not rich. When Pose happened, I felt like I had more autonomy over my visibility. I felt like I had more space to show people who I was instead of just having other people tell what they think I am to each other. I didn't drink that much, I swear. I want to glow for the wedding. I get to use fashion as an introduction. I can use fashion as an invitation. Fashion is also such an intimate and personal story for me as a trans person in a world where what I wear is an act of political strife. <laughs> the whole story about how trans people exist in the world with what we have to live with is all connected to how we dress, what we choose to wear. Fashion is power, but especially and especially for women. Starting in the 1940s until now, the black model has had a presence in every decade. Trends of the time defined how much the black model worked, how often we saw the black model, and the amount of black models working. Let's hope it's not a trend. Let's hope it doesn't end, and then we don't see the black model again, as it has in the past. I have the highest level of gratitude for an industry that takes the outcasts and makes them beautiful. Without representation, I wouldn't have considered being a model. I wouldn't have known it was possible. It's amazing to see the evolution and to know that I had like a small part in that. The survival of us keeping the eye on the prize. That is what this is about. To all the people who champion us, who are coming up now, who are doing so much, thank you for thinking of us. Thank you for making us beautiful. It's been a long, long, long time, you know, pushing for this representation and, and diversity. There's no closed doors, you know, you can, like, break all these glass ceilings by just being yourself. It's just so powerful. Black models, queer folks, people of color, to just pass on the baton and say it is possible. Black women should always stick to their guns and know where you came from and march on the shoulders of those who came before you and realize your opportunities open the doors for other people, so stay strong, don't give up. I'm excited about what the future holds. There's nothing but beautiful changes and positive things to come. My goal is that in 20 years that when we're talking about it, we're talking about the start of this huge transformation of you know, having a more expansive space. That's my, my hope. I kind of want 
young kids, young black women to know that there is a standpoint, there is a table, and maybe there's no seat to bring your own chair. The fight is an ongoing process. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's really just given me, like, confidence that I just didn't feel before, knowing that it's helped somebody, that my efforts have helped somebody really. I mean, I'm just so grateful and thankful that I'm able to do that. Thank you. Bye. That's a cut. <laughs> I was going to say that. We did it. We did it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, God bless you all. That was powerful. <laughs> Supreme. And I'm out.